In 13th century northeastern Italy and southern France, there flourished a dualist form of Christianity whose origins, while obscure, may stretch back to the Gnostics of the late classical world. These Cathars, literally the pure ones, rejected the Catholic Church. They urged a simple life of angelic holiness, only offering a single sacrament, the consolamentum, meant to perfect and then liberate the trapped angelic soul within the clay prison of their body. Their church was said to be egalitarian with both women and men in leadership, and even their diet was pescatarian, wishing not to consume things born of physical, sexual reproduction. Issuing titles, they were simply referred to as the good men and women, and often went preaching this message of pacifism, equality, and spiritual liberation in pairs through Italy and southern France. There, their message flourished. However, to the institutional medieval church, their counter-church was nothing short of diabolical heresy and positively unholy violence was unleashed to eradicate it. Thus followed the 30-year Albigensian Crusade, where thousands were massacred, with many being burned alive, and numerous subsequent years of inquisitorial interrogations, torture, and forced conversions to orthodoxy. The last known Cathar was executed in the autumn of 1321. But to get at just what the Cathars held to be their authentic interpretation of Christianity, we have to peel away layers of inquisitorial documents, moldering manuscripts held in numerous libraries, and obscure references spread littered throughout history. In this series, we're going to be exploring what little remains of Cathar literature. Despite their horrifying persecution, a small collection of Cathar texts have survived, and from these we can glean a bit of their theology, their ritual life, and their theory of salvation. And in this episode, I want to turn to what is probably the most sustained discussion of Cathar theology as composed by a Cathar, the Liber de Duobus Principiis, or the Book of the Two Principles, in which radical metaphysical dualism is argued for, and the freedom of the will, at least the freedom of the righteous will, is argued against, and even rival Cathars are called out. If you're interested in Gnosticism, Hermetic philosophy, alchemy, or the academic study of the occult, make sure to subscribe here to Esoterica and check out my other content on topics in esotericism, including curated playlists. Also, if you want to support this work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube for free, I'd hope you consider supporting the channel by taking a look over at my Patreon, maybe buying a t-shirt over at our store tab, maybe a one-time donation, or you can just use the handy-dandy super thanks option just below the video. You can find all those links below, and I really appreciate you considering supporting the channel and the project of Esoterica. But now, let's turn to the Liber de Duobus Principiis, or the Book of the Two Principles, of these famous medieval Gnostics, the Cathars. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. So, just as a kind of opening caveat, I'll be taking up what is called the traditional position on the Cathars throughout this episode, though recent scholarship has actually strongly argued that there may have never really been an organized movement of Cathars at all, and thus it's not quite true to say this is a text representing their theology. Now, I've actually laid out the skeptical position on the existence of the Cathars in another episode. You can check out that episode up in the card above. In fact, making this series is somewhat of a methodological mess for me personally. Over the years, as I've studied the historical documents about the Cathars in chronological order, I've personally become much more convinced of the skeptical camp, if I'm just going to be honest. That's 
That's kind of my bias in this episode. But this is also a place where I want to do my best to bracket my own beliefs, admit my biases, and still try to present the traditional account of the Cathars in order to facilitate learning about them, or perhaps learning about the complex debates of the medieval period and their heresies more generally. So, with that admission and with that caveat, let's turn to the Cathars. The traditional position on the Cathars, which has only really emerged since the 19th century, holds that they were a dualist variant of Christianity introduced into Central Europe and taking hold primarily in northern Italy and southern France, especially in the Languedoc region, with its origins in Eastern European dualist schools, typically known as Bogomilism. Such a dualist version of Christianity may indeed have its roots all the way back to the Gnostics of late antiquity, although there's a lot of debate about that continuity. While there existed some internal variation, the central core was that reality was divided into ontologically distinct good and spiritual and evil and physical camps. Human souls were originally angels that were stolen out of heaven and then trapped into the physical world by Satan, such that if they do not undergo spiritual purification, they would be caught up in a cycle of reincarnation, basically forever. To achieve salvation, the Cathars had spiritual leaders who led lives of extreme and strict purity. These folks were referred to as the Perfecti, who would welcome other believers or supporting others into a life of purity, such that at the very end of their lives, they were allowed to have the sole Cathar sacrament, the Consolamentum. This ritual would purify the soul such that it could escape the physical body and the physical realm more generally to be reinstated into that purely spiritual angelic realm ruled over by Christ forever. All right, with that said, I've already covered some of the foundational text of the Cathars, including their really complex relationship to the Bible, their inheritance of the vision of Isaiah, and a, a text they refer to as the Cana Secreta, or the Secret Supper in a previous episode. So again, you may want to check out those as well. But in this episode, I want to turn to what is the largest and most complete surviving work of Cathar theology, actually written probably by a Cathar the Liber de Duobos Principiis, or the Book of the Two Principles. This text survives in a single manuscript. A single manuscript, that's how close we came to losing it. Probably again produced by the Cathars themselves sometime in the middle of the 13th century in the region near Lake Garda in northern Italy. Now, Catharism, like Waldensianism, were both able to hold out much more successfully in northern Italy than in southern France, given the ferocity of the Albigensian War, the genocidal violence of the Albigensian War, and the subsequent 50 years of intense inquisition that followed after that. In fact, Waldensianism survived well through that and survives to this very day. The text itself is anonymous, but strongly reflects the thought of John of Lugio as recounted in Renarius Sacco's Summa de Catharis that was composed earlier that century. Sacco, we should also note, was himself, along with his teacher, Peter of Verona, both Cathars, I think even Cathar bishops who had actually become Dominicans. Peter, for his anti-Cathar work in the region, was actually assassinated by Carino Balsamo, hired by the Cathars of Milan, and was actually subsequently canonized as a saint only 11 months after his murder, making him actually the fastest canonization in the entire history of the Catholic Church. So, fun fact. However, that assassin, Carino Balsamo, would later run all a do confession, do penance, and become a Dominican Beatus himself. So this is just the best reality show ever. Aside from all this literal cloak and dagger, John of Lugio may very well have been the author of the Book of the Two Principles, and Sacco's Summa de Catharis is, aside from the Book of the Two Principles, our best insight into not only Cathar theology generally, but the differences in the various Cathar sects active at that time. Specifically, John of Lugio and the Book of the Two Principles represents the Albaneses, a Cathar faction who held to radical metaphysical dualism, while their opponents, the Garantesses, held to a kind of modified dualism, as we'll see more in just a moment. The text of the Book of the Two Principles, while certainly not the, I don't know, the paragon of scholastic clarity and dialectic, clearly reveals pretty significant learning on the part of its author, who had a very strong command of the Vulgate, the Bible. In fact, this book is 
densely populated with scriptural citations. It may even make up the bulk of the book as we have it, but also draws on Roman legal texts, the popular philosophical book, the Liber de Calcis, Aristotle's Physics, and the Jewish Neoplatonist Ibn Gabirol. The author also seems familiar with some of the early scholastics, specifically the Bishop of Paris, William of Auvergne. The text itself is haphazardly edited, some of the internal sections aren't really logically ordered, and a random bit of Cathar text is inserted into section 7, and it's not clear that the order that we find it in now was the actual original order of the text. So, Oh, also there's a really cool cryptogram on folio 51 mentioning a certain Sangambinus who probably, possibly, was one of the scribes of the text itself. It records him having received the Cathar ritual of the Consolamentum. At any rate, the text is divided into seven sections of varying lengths and was apparently written as both a polemic against the Garantesses, the other rival Cathar faction, and, well, the Catholics, but also was meant to be as an instruction for beginners, chiefly defending the radical dualism of the Albaneses, or the true Christians as the text styles themselves, but also their rejection of free will at least the freedom of the will for those who are righteous, but we'll get to those issues in just a minute as we turn to the text itself. The Book of the Two Principles centers around a central theological dilemma. How could a purely good God have created a world in which evil was possible at all? Specifically, the text puzzles about how the angels would eventually fall into sin through their revolt against that very God. Now, to tease this out, there are two background assumptions that are lurking and operating in Cathar thought, and we need to tease those out. Well, I say Cathar thought, I mean this particular Cathar. The first is a principle from the Neoplatonic book, the Liber de Calcis, by which all effects are metaphysically bound up in their causes, no matter how remote that cause might be. That's to say that there is always a metaphysical connection between a cause and an effect, because, to the logic of this idea, every possible effect exists in potentia within a given cause. Secondly, this text also rejects Augustine's position that God's knowledge, God's will, and divine causation are analytically and metaphysically distinct. For Augustine, that while God knows the truth values of all proposition, God is omniscient, including propositions about future events, that knowledge neither impels the divine will nor causes those future events to occur. Think of it kind of like knowing how a movie will end doesn't make it end that way. Now this is basically how Augustine preserves both divine omniscience but also free will and thus ethical choice and its consequences, mostly being rightly rewarded by going to heaven and rightly punished by going to hell if you reject the truth of Christianity. The Cathars, or at least the Albanesis, rejected this position because of their acceptance of the metaphysical relationship between cause and effect that they adopted from that text, a Libre de Calcis, which was actually written by Proclus. But the existence of evil, in this case, the revolt of the angels produces a kind of really classical paradox. How could a purely good God create or even allow for evil in the world at all? In other words, how did the good, the perfectly good, cause the perfectly evil? Now, the classic free will argument that we typically see used won't work for the Cathars. Why? Because if all effects are ontologically derivative of their causes, even the capacity for evil on the part of the angels would have to mean that such a capacity would have been well, it had to have existed first in the divine for it to exist inside of an angel. Clearly a metaphysical contradiction for a perfectly good God. So free will is not going to be their answer. So what is their answer? Well, there must exist an ontologically distinct principle responsible for the potential and actuality of evil. There must be two metaphysical principles in the universe, one good and one evil hence the name of the book, the Book of the Two Principles. This argument forms the core of the text and the radical dualism that Cathar is famous or infamous for, and the rest of the book is basically detailing the theological ramifications of this position, improving them via reference to the Bible and philosophical dialectic. 
For instance, if God is the only metaphysical goodness in existence, then our will, if it is good, is just the divine will. But the divine will could never be anything other than that goodness, and thus being incapable of being anything other than good is not free, strictly speaking. Thus, the Cathars, interestingly enough, reject the freedom of the will for the righteous. To choose anything other than the divinely good will, which could never be otherwise than it is, is always to choose lesser than the good, and that is just, well, it's just evil. There are only two metaphysical principles operating in their logic, after all. From here, the text turns to the notion of God as a creator. Generally speaking, that is taken to mean that God created the universe from nothing, creatio ex nihil, including physical reality and human beings with the capacity to do good, but also to sin. The text rejects all three of these positions. Rather, the Cathars understand the verbs to create and to form in three very specific senses. When something is made and made better, when sin is converted to goodness, and finally, when God allows the good to undergo the perditions of evil for another greater good. In these three senses, God's creative power is logically restricted to God's nature as a being of pure goodness, and is thus at a remove from the creation of the physical cosmos, much less the potential or activity of evil. Further, when scripture attests that God is responsible for all things, or the source of universal causation, this is again taken in an extremely technical sense, that all, or every, is restricted to things that are already good, that which was good but has become evil but will ultimately be redeemed, and those things which are just purely evil. God is obviously responsible for the good and the redemption of the once good, but cannot logically be responsible for or even interact with universals which are of course, purely evil. Now, you may see that as a limitation on God's omnipotence. God is somehow incapable of creating or interacting with evil. It's not a very powerful God. But for the Cathars, this is a feature and not a bug. In their thinking, God would not create what God would not will, and further, to will evil would require God to contain a contradictory state of affairs, being both purely good and purely evil at once, which is nonsense. They think that's just utter rubbish logic. Thus, defining omnipotence such that God must be in any fashion responsible for evil is simply proffering a contradiction. It's proffering a nonsensical definition of that term. And that's not a limitation on God. It's just stupidity on the part of the person making such an argument. Oh yeah, and I should mention, this text is pretty salty, referring to its opponents as inducti, the unlearned, or imperiti, the unenlightened, are just wicked and foolish. Wicked and foolish just kind of rolls off the tongue. So we have a pretty good sense of how the Cathars perceived God, that is, as a being of pure goodness. But what about the second principle? You know, evil. Well, evil, like good for them, is eternally pre-existent and form the material world as we know it as a kind of prison for souls. Those souls, which are actually of a finite number, exist and are actually angels stolen out of heaven during an ancient insurrection before being plunged into physical bodies and eventually subjected to multiple cycles of reincarnation. That evil principle, it's Satan or the devil, created the physical world out of eternally existing matter and competes with God by seeking to keep those stolen angels trapped in his realm. One of the principal methods that the devil is said to use in this ongoing war with God, aside from, you know, the temptations of the physical body, is by convincing human beings that he, the devil, is God alone and commanding them to do sin as if they were doing righteous deeds. The Book of Two Principles actually detects this subterfuge in the biblical accounts where God commands people to do dreadful and morally abhorrent things, like the genocidal conquest of Canaan by the Israelites, the command to Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac, are some of the more brutal instances of the Mosaic Law, especially all those animal sacrifices. All of these are taken to be examples of the devil actually tricking people into vice by pretending that it's virtue. Indeed, any time in the Bible that God appears to someone, such as the burning bush, that is taken to be an instance of satanic manifestation. 
the one true God could could never be seen by physical eyes. Remember, this thing is just a prison invented by the devil. However, Jesus appeared in the physical world to teach people the truth about this cosmos and how to, you know, get the hell out, escape it, through a life of austere purity and postmortem escape from the cycle of reincarnation, hence the term Cathar, the ones who are pure. But the key word there is appear. Jesus never had a physical body, and his torture and death were necessary illusions basically to trick the devil until he returned back to his own world, a parallel universe to ours, but his, of course, is purely spiritual in nature and thus good. In fact, it's to that realm, if one purifies oneself in this life, that you escape to after death. Although it may take a while, eventually it seems that Cathar theology held that all of the stolen angels would be returned to that perfectly spiritual realm and that the physical and spiritual realms will again be utterly separated from one another, the devil and his demons being trapped in this physical world forever. In the midst of this very colorful discussion, the author launches into an attack on another Cathar sect, the Garantensis. So we can actually get to see a glimpse of like inter Cathar beef. The Garantenses were moderate dualists holding that the devil was created by God and merely corrupted the four elements by which God had created the world. And thus matter was in itself not fundamentally evil, just corrupt. They also held that the entirety of the Old Testament was the work of the devil. Unlike the Albanesses, who interestingly enough held that only certain parts of the Old Testament were the work of the devil. However, like the Albanesses, they did abstain from eating meat, eating eggs, eating cheese, and from marriage. Again, reproducing physical prisons is not a good thing to do. Now, all of this strikes the writer of the text as logically and performatively contradictory. If the devil wrote the entire Old Testament, why did the Garantenses quote from it to bolster their own position? How did a good God create a being of evil in the first place, and if the physical world was ultimately the creation of a good God, then why abstain from the products of that creation? Eat eggs and cheese. I mean, you're French and Italian. Further, if God made this world, then isn't he, them, responsible, fundamentally responsible for the evil inside of it and not the devil? Why a devil at all? Why don't God just do this stuff? In fact, the writer of the Book of the Two Principles actually just calls for a public debate on these matters. I mean, can you imagine being called out in the 13th century by Cathars? You can only imagine how much I would have enjoyed watching a Cathar factional debate in real time in the 13th century. Man, you miss out on the good times. The text comes to a conclusion discussing the persecutions of Jesus, although Jesus was kind of an illusion, so I'm not sure how you could persecute him the persecution of the early church and the true Christians, clearly meant to be the Almanesses. Just as the prophets and the early Christians were persecuted by demonic forces, so too will persecution always come to true Christians. I mean, the devil's waging a war against God, he's going to persecute the true Christians. In fact, persecution is actually for the overall good, and moreover, it's proof of the truth of the true Christians. Otherwise, the devil just wouldn't bother. Of course, the writer of the text knew full well how much the Cathars had suffered, and it's actually a fascinating polemic against the Inquisition against them, that their very persecution of the Cathars reveals that they, the Catholics, are the forces of Satan, and that the Cathars, in their very being persecuted, are the true Christians. They're the true church. In this way, the text comes to a poignant and powerful ending, using their own persecution as a weapon against their persecutors. The Cathars remain as interesting as they are mysterious, and we are lucky that at least one rare treatise of theirs survives. And while it's not easy reading, it's densely packed with biblical references, and its quasi-scholastic style can be a bit perplexing for someone without a background in medieval philosophy, it really is worthwhile, it really is worth studying. The Book of the Two Principles, again, it survives in just one manuscript, and it provides us our best and most sustained glimpse into their theology, even their disputes with other Cathars in their own words. And for that reason, among many others, it deserves careful analysis.
You can find it online, I'll have a link in the description, but you can also read it in the excellent collection of primary sources on the Cathars and the Waldensians and Wakefield and Evans Heresies of the High Middle Ages, an absolutely must-have volume if you're interested in Gnosticism and stuff like that. I've also listed a text of other great books on the Cathars and the recent arguments about whether they historically existed as such in the description, so you can check out those as well. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.